Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Aviv Rotman, and uh, I'm an algorithm engineer from Taboola. And first of all, I'd, uh, I'll congratulate you for making it to the last uh, lecture of the day. Thank you very much. Um, and I also want to talk to you a bit about um, lessons that we learned uh, using deep learning to build recommender systems at Taboola. So um, you've probably seen Taboola before where that little widget at the bottom of articles you're reading, maybe on ESPN or CNBC or Ynet, and um, we recommend articles that uh, maybe you'd like to read, um, if it's in the site or outside of the site uh, from uh, our advertisers. And uh, just to frame our problem a bit in terms of scale, we have a lot of scale. We um, recommend around 500,000 uh, recommendations per second. Um, we see around uh, um, 1.4 billion unique users a month. And uh, that means that we need to uh, do these recommendations very quickly um, because, uh, because we need to uh, answer that sale scale around 20 milliseconds. And the other thing you guys need to know before we start is um, that uh, Taboola has quite a few algorithm engineers, um, 45 to be exact. And uh, what's an algorithm engineer? Well, it's both the data scientist and the software engineer um, who uh, uh, work on a problem. Um, any of us and all of us uh, are able to do uh, the analysis, the modeling, uh, design experiments, and write whatever code is needed in order to bring these experiments to production and then monitor them after we've decided that uh, they're good to go. And uh, that means that our team and our pipeline is geared toward continuous experimentations sometimes multiple people on the same model. And uh, the last thing I'd like to say is that if you've seen uh, any uh, buzzwordy, cool technology that's not on our logo wall, then I'll buy you a beer. Um, so I'll talk a bit about uh, our problem, recommender systems at scale, and then I'll talk about the challenges that uh, this problem brings and, and that our research uh, organization also creates. And then I'll talk a bit about the architecture we chose in order to solve this problem and how we feed the, uh, a couple features into this model. So um, our problem, rec a recommender system, around two, th uh, 2 billion times a day, a user will surf onto a site where Taboola exists, and we'll need to decide around N recommendations to give that user that'll maximize Taboola and the publisher's uh, revenue. Um, we have around a million possible recommendations we can, we can uh, recommend, and they come with a CPC, a cost per click, um, which is how much the advertiser is willing to pay for this, uh, for this click. And we uh, have the job of deciding what's the probability that the user will actually click on this, on this uh, article. Um, and and uh, we'll use that number, CPC times CTR, in order to rank our, our recommendations. So how do we do that? We take features from the recommendations, um, these are articles, so we can take like the title and the thumbnail that the, the advertisers have provided us, and we take things that we have about the page view, like what time it is, what site we're on, what browser the user is coming from, and we take things about the user, like uh, since Taboola is all around the internet, we can say things about the user's reading preferences, what they've clicked on in our widget, what things they like to read, what categories, and so on. We take all that, put it in a, in a model, and try to... Um, uh, predict the CTR. And then we use that to rank, and that's what you see in the end. So what's the problem with this uh, um, problem? Well, it's pretty hard. Um, first of all, th there are multiple reasons, but uh, first, our world, our, our uh, recommender system is in constant flux. We have around 100,000 new items a day, and we have millions of new users a day. So there's all the time um, uh, data points that we don't have much, we haven't seen much in our system. And um, the, another problem that uh, is probably worth mentioning is that our feedback, the, pr the uh, variable that we're trying to predict, is implicit. Um, what does that mean? We try to predict uh, a click. Um, and a click is a fairly straightforward, explicit uh, um, uh, signal of interest, but a non-click, if a user didn't click on an article, it doesn't mean that they don't like that article. It could be they didn't see it, it could be that they were preoccupied, it could be that they weren't even beside the computer, and that doesn't mean that they don't like the article, making our signal very noisy. So let's talk a bit about the state of the art. So in around 2006, um, um, many of you probably heard that Netflix released the, Netflix, the first Netflix challenge. 
um, in which they challenged uh, everyone to try to recommend new movies to users. And what they gave was a bunch of movies and a bunch of users. And they gave the ratings that those users g g uh, uh, rated a couple of the movies. Um, so uh, the, the person who ended up winning, um, what he did was he took the, the, the movies and the users and he uh, ordered them in a matrix where every uh, user was a column and every movie was a row. And in every cell where we had data, we put the, rating, the ranking. In our case, that would be um, a click or not a click, one or zero. Um, then he um, factorized this matrix. Um, you could use any, any uh, uh, matrix factorization uh, algorithm, let's say uh, SVD, and he got a dense representation of every movie and every user. And then by uh, combining, uh, using dot product, users and movies that never met each other, you'd get a rank for that user. In our case, you'd get um, uh, the probability for a click. Okay, so these uh, um, dense representations, in fact, uh, um, represent the movies and the users based on the users that did rank them and, and, uh, and the movies that they ranked, okay? Um, what's the problem with matrix factorization? Although it took the Netflix challenge by storm, it doesn't deal at all with the cold start problem, meaning uh, it doesn't deal at all with users or movies or articles that we don't have any data um, regarding them. Um, so it's uh, uh, in, in, in effect, in, 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 we're unable to use it. And um, <clears throat> it also doesn't use all the data that we have at our, at our uh, disposal, uh, disposal. Like uh, it doesn't use the creative of the articles, like the image and the text. It doesn't use anything regarding the user's reading preference, um, which is data we could use to make the model generalized. So what form of uh, uh, models is good at understanding things like text and language and historical data um, and, and images? Um, deep learning, of course. So let's try to model uh, this matrix factorization problem in the form of a, of a deep neural network. So instead of a matrix, I'll give every user an embedding, a dense embedding, a random one, and I'll do, that, th do the same for every target. And then I'll do a dot product between them, feed that into a sigmoid, and try to predict a click or, or, or not a click. Um, then slowly I'll use gradient descent in order to correct these random representations until I get something that is fairly representative of both the user and the target based on, on uh, users that clicked on targets and targets that were clicked on by users. Um, these uh, uh, dense representations in deep learning have a name. We call them embeddings. Um, and now it's fairly easy to understand how I can add uh, other features into the, into the model. I can just create an embedding of the same size of, uh, of new features, like let's say the article the user is on or the publisher, and um, just create an embedding, do a dot product between everything and everything, feed that into a sigmoid and try to predict a click or, or not a click. And now suddenly if the user, I have no data about them, but I do know which publisher they're on, I'm not starting from nowhere. So <coughs> this implement, deep implementation of a factorization machine, of a, a matrix factorization is called a factorization machine. But it also has its limits. Um, these limits come when I know things about the world that my model doesn't. Like I know that <coughs> the interaction between a user and a target is different, is different than the action between a publisher and a target. And trying to learn these two representations at the same time, a user interaction with a target and a publisher interaction with a target, will um, uh, delay convergence. So it's sort of like trying to use a circular key on a, a uh, square lock and on a circular lock at the same time, it's better to just have another key, right? So in this case, what I can do is I can create a representation for every kind of interaction that I think is different. I'll call these different representations fields. And every time I want to, to, to do an interaction between one of the fields and another, let's say the, the publisher and the target and the user and the target, I'll use a different uh, vector. And uh, that way, I'll make it easier for my model to understand the differences between these interactions. But what if I want to do um, more complex interactions, like maybe three-way interactions or five-way interactions? Well, I'm a deep learning researcher, right? So I'll just add dense networks. Um, and that's indeed what we did. And this uh, final model um, is called uh, field-aware factorization machines, or as we 
tend to uh, shorten it, FFMs. Now, the important thing to take away from this is that any feature you want to add to this model, all you need to do is bring it to, the, to a situation where it's a constant uh, dense vector um, an embedding. And as long as the embedding is the same size as the other embeddings, you can do a dot product and feed it into the interaction layer and try to predict um, a click or not a click or whatever um, you're trying to predict. Um, this is especially interesting for us because we have various uh, kinds of data which uh, may have uh, already solved implementations or um, maybe a, a pre-trained network or something like that that we, uh, we'd like to use. And, uh, and um, we're also working maybe five, six, seven, ten people on the same network at the same time, and I don't want to have to rework the network for every new feature, right? So, as long, so I can just plug and play these, these um, as we call modalities, into the network. So let's see a couple of these. Um, let's talk about user history. So this is probably one of our most important features and also um, most uh, specific to Taboola because um, we show the users multiple recommendations uh, every day and we know if they clicked or don't clicked and we can use that to uh, sort of represent the user's interest in terms of as far as Taboola goes. So how do, but the problem with, uh, with user history is it's, it's a changing le length, right? Um, I may have a use user with uh, five items in their history, and I may have a user with 50, and I may have a user with 500. Um, but I need a, a, a vector which is of constant length. So how will I do that? Um, luckily, there's a common practice of just averaging everything. It's called a bag of words, or in this case, let's say bag of categories or bag of advertisers. So I create an embedding for every category. And then I just do a mean over all the categories that I want to put into the, in, into the uh, representation. And I hope that my model will learn some average representation based on the categories for that user. Um, but histories are more complex. A user might click more on one item, on one category, and less on the other category. And if I'm just doing a flat average, then I'm just giving one or zero to uh, every uh, category based on if the user clicked on it or they didn't. But let's say for this user, it might be interesting to give sports a stronger weight than tech because the user clicks more on sports, right? So I can just use the clicks as the weight, right? Um, this way I'll get an average embedding which gives a higher emphasis on sports. But surprisingly, this user doesn't like sports more than they like tech because uh, it just seems that way because they've seen sports much, much more than they've seen uh, tech. But uh, in the case of tech, one out of two um, times that they see tech, they'll click on it, so they probably like tech a lot more. So I'll just take the CTR, the, the, the uh, probability of a click on a, on a category for this user, and use that to weight it, and that's how we do it in Taboola. And in the end, I get an embedding of the same size as all the other embeddings in the network, and I plug that into the FFM, and lo and behold, I have a, a, an, a feature that represents the user based on uh, their uh, browsing history. But I said I'd talk about deep learning, and um, what do, does deep learning do well? Well, it, it does probably image analysis very well and natural language processing, and we have a lot of that at Taboola. The reason we have a lot of that is because users, when we give them a recommendation, only see the title and the image. That's the only thing they see. They don't know anything else about the, about the articles that they're going to read, and uh, that means that we should probably do a very good job of predicting CTR based on only these two features. <coughs> but how would we model um, something that, like, let's say, the title easily? Um, so luckily, we don't have to invent the wheel in this case. We can just go, go to the very, very basic deep learning practices like word to vec So what is word to vec For those who don't know, it's uh, a, a way of embedding words by trying to predict a word based on its context, based on the sentences that ap it appears in. And we did that on our titles on maybe, let's say, a year or a year and a half of uh, titles uh, in, in Taboola. And um, then we started looking at the models. Um, this here is a tensor board. It's kind of hard to see, but um, tensor board, which is a, a tool um, that uh, Google provide in order to investigate deep, uh, deep models uh, built with TensorFlow. And here I've just taken um, my word to vec model and uh, um, put it into a 2D, uh, into a 2D representation and um, used uh, the query of one word, in this case Celtics, 
in order to find the nearest neighbors of those words. And um, if you look closely, you can see over here that Celtics uh, appear by other NBA teams like uh, the Raptors and um, the Pacers and the Knicks. But um, an interesting thing is that uh, the other nearest neighbors um, appear in two other clusters. And on the left, you see nearest neighbors that are also sports teams, but in this case, baseball teams, like the Yankees and the Cubs. And on the top right, there are teams, there are other sports teams that are, in this case, football teams, like the Patriots and the Giants. And what's interesting about this is I just asked them the, the, the model to try to uh, embed words. And it learned the difference between different uh, sports leagues in the US without me ever asking that. And we also wanted to see if the model is able to learn things that are related to the structure of the text. So um, we looked at a, a, a word, let's say amazing, and we saw that the words that were closest to it were incredible, awesome, and other positive words. Um, but then when we looked at a very close word to amazing, like amazingly, um, we saw uh, that it wasn't close to those words that amazing was close to. It was close to words like uh, insanely, ridiculously, and absurdly. And in fact, the model had learned the difference between an adjective and an adverb, so it understood grammar. Um, and then we tried to see, like take it a bit forward and try to see if the model was able, if this word to vec model <laughs> using uh, just a bagging technique, just averaging the entire sentence, was able to understand sentences. And it did it pretty well, much, well, much better than we've, we expected it to do. Um, I entered the sentence, how diverse technologies will end our water crisis. And the model didn't understand only questions or something like that, but it understood um, things like how a technology will help something uh, to do with social good. Like um, how IT solutions are helping to prevent disease or how data is helping to meet new healthcare goals. So it understood something like very uh, profound about these sentences. And then we could just take that, since we were using bag of words, and feed that into our model. So um, uh, in, in, in summary, uh, the things that I'd like you to go to take home is um, recommender systems are interesting, but they are also hard, especially if you're uh, in a dynamic environment where you have a constant influx of data. And um, deep learning isn't a, a magical black box. It's not that you can just take a model off the shelf and, and use it. You'll need to put some effort into finding the correct model for your problem and for your research environment like we did with FFM, which allows us to work multiple people on the same uh, problem at the same time and uh, do something that uh, involves multiple modalities. And if we're talking about that, um, finding the correct way to, to the correct architecture to describe your features is key. Um, people may say that deep learning is, uh, uh, d has done away with feature engineering. Well, architecture is the new feature engineering. And with that, um, I'd like to say thanks for staying, and if you have any questions.